Hi, I'm Shelley Palmer. This is Context for the Future, and I'm here with Carolyn Everson, who's the VP of Marketing Solutions globally, the global head of Marketing Solutions for Facebook. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you very much for having me, Shelley. Yeah, it's great to see you. So, Facebook's been in the news a little bit. Yes, just, that is true. Just a little. And uh, all kidding aside, the biggest issue is trust. People want to know more than ever before, can they trust Facebook to guard their privacy? Yes, no, maybe? People can absolutely trust Facebook, and, and I'll tell you why, because it's more than just me giving you words. At the end of the day, without trust, we actually have no business. The entire way that Facebook is run is it built on connections of people, connections between people, connections between people and businesses. We have to safeguard people's data. We need to ensure that we're accountable on how we do that. We need to be transparent about how we do that. And most importantly, we need to give people full control over the data that we collect and how it's utilized. Having said that, we certainly have made some mistakes over the last handful of years. And I want to acknowledge those mistakes and most importantly, accept our responsibility on fixing them. In the last year, we have taken significant actions to restore people's trust around data privacy. For example, we took the GDPR ruling, which was in the EU, and we decided, which essentially allows people to decide what information is going to be utilized and to take it out of the system in, in a simple context. We decided that is not just going to go into the EU, we're going to roll that out globally. That is one example. We have data privacy checkups now readily available on Facebook. However, what we have learned is that although we've made significant product improvements, there is a lot more we need to do on consumer education. People don't quite understand this new world of data. You wrote a piece just this um, week, and the, the piece talked about how data is being fueled, and people are fueling every aspect, whether it's a Fitbit, every item that we're utilizing in this new world. And so I think the onus is on us at Facebook, but the onus is also on the entire industry. We've got to provide better education for consumers, and we're committed to doing that. So if I'm just a consumer, and I don't know very much about anything except I like to use Facebook, and I'm hearing all kinds of stuff about how my data is being used. I don't know how I'm harmed because I, I don't know enough to know what's happening. It's not identity theft per se, but people feel like they're being used by the process. How are you going to convince them or what are you guys doing to either convince or teach or educate, whatever words you want to use, consumers that this is, you're giving up certain amounts of data for the quality of, of enjoying the the internet or the web a certain way, and if you don't want this contextual world brought to you, if you want it willy-nilly um, in a disorganized manner, then you can have that, but you can't have both. Like, how do you get that point across in a simple, easy way? I think we have to be very clear that we are committed to having Facebook be a free service, which means the way we have to make money as a company in order to provide the service for 2.6 billion people is we do it through advertising. Our obligation is to explain to people very clearly, not just through the terms of service, because we know that not everybody reads the terms of service. Right. Many of us have clicked on different apps and downloaded things and we haven't read the details on what information is being provided. So what we're trying to do is within the product, really tee up those privacy checkups, really simple tools for people to understand, okay, I've given my name, I've given my email, here's my phone number, is it being used, is it not being used, are my interests being used, and really simplify it. But it can't just be done in product. What we started to work on in 2018, and will be an increased focus in 2019, is actually physically get with people. Put the face to Facebook and show up in local communities. So we're starting to do privacy checkups. We did one at Bryant Park during the holiday season, and we had over a thousand people come in. A, they were amazed that, oh my God, there's people. It's Facebook is actual humans here. And Facebook, you care. You want to explain this. If all 2.6 billion people fully understood the way their data is utilized, and more importantly, the way it's not, that would be a huge win. A yeah. huge win, not just for us, but for people in general. So we've got a long way to go to get 2.6 billion people to fully understand it. But I do think education, both physical, being in communities, as well as online, is critical. Do you think the company is committed to shutting down the policies that allowed this perceived abuse? And if so, does that limit the kind of value adds that other third parties can bring to Facebook? 
Interestingly enough, a lot of the press stories that happened in latter part of 2018 were around things that happened four years ago, yeah. where we made substantive changes to our policy, and yet we were now revisiting those stories four to five years later. So, A, have we made changes? We've made significant changes. We are restricting a tremendous amount of what is going out, sort of data out to third parties. And we think that's critical to restore people's trust. Over time, what we really want to do is enhance the product experience for people. So how do you, you talked about, well, you could either have a very customized experience or you can have an experience that's super generic. What we know is that people actually, if it's customized, they get value out of it. Right. They see the friends that are most important to them, their family members. They see products from advertisers that they care about the most or could add more value to their lives. We've got a lot of work to do on that, but we've unquestionably, unquestionably made significant changes to our policies. And some of the things that we did many years ago, we shut that down in 2014 and 2015, and we are reviewing everything. There's a full review over every aspect of what data comes in and what data goes out, and we'll continue to do the hard work there. So that leads me to the meta question I want to ask. Mark's vision and the mission of Facebook is to connect the world. He is going to, you're on the internet, we're going to connect everybody. And I think that's a very optimistic view of humanity and of the future, but it hasn't unfolded in the most optimistic of ways. Uh, how, if at all, has the policy or the vision or the mission adapted to the reality that not every actor is a good actor? So the mission has evolved. It, it, we're on our second version of our mission since Mark started the company. <clears throat> and the first mission was just, as you said, to connect people. And what Mark realized uh, over a year and a half, two years ago now, he realized that connecting people in and of itself uh, digitally is not good enough. That what is, the, what is the goal? What are we trying to do? So then the mission evolved to be about bringing the world closer together and creating community. Those were sort of the two key pillars of the mission. Underneath it, here's how I would say we're thinking about it. 2.6 billion people. Let's say Facebook didn't exist and there were just 2.6 billion people on planet Earth. That's humanity. That would be the representation of humanity. And there would be a ton of good and there would be bad. Yeah. I think our mistakes over the last handful of years have been we have not recognized and thought about the bad as much as we needed to. And when I think about Facebook today versus a year ago, we're a fundamentally different company. It's a different DNA. We're asking different questions. Every product now we're looking at saying, okay, this is the intention of that right. product, but what are all of the bad things yeah. that somebody can do? We have people now on our teams that all they do is think about the bad things that people could <laughs> potentially do. It's the right way to do it. Right, but we didn't do that a couple of years ago. And so uh, you're seeing an evolution. Now, at the highest level, I still deeply believe that connecting people and giving them a voice is a net positive thing for the world. Sure. When you see some of the amazing things that happen on our platform, Giving Tuesday, a million people donated $125 million yeah. in one day. A billion dollars have been donated since we had the donation tool. Safety check, which helps people in a natural disaster or a terrorist situation, a fire, 1,400 times it's been utilized and billions of people have been notified and that their family and friends are safe. People are in meaningful groups. You know, when I visit and I have a, a, the privilege of traveling to see many of these countries and when I see a group, for example, in India, there's a teacher for teachers group where 6,000 teachers in India collect their information, share best practices, share resources. There's 100,000 farmers connected in Africa talking about best practices on farming and the impacts of weather. So. I could go on and on around the positive, but that does not mean that we don't recognize right. there is bad. That's humanity, and we are a reflection of humanity. Our job is to maximize the good and minimize the bad. I think that's all of our jobs, actually. So <clears throat> I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the fact that you have 2.6 billion people on Facebook, uh, which is an extraordinary number. I think that there's only four billion people online total, so that's a substantial portion of planet Earth's internet users and, and uh, network users. I'm a business, I don't have any choice. I have got to look at you and I have to look at Google and I have to think about how that's gonna drive my business because 
the communities that get built around my business are almost always going to exist on Facebook in some form, whether I'm there or not. Mm -hmm. So driving business outcomes is becoming the most important thing for the marketers that we work with. Tell me a little bit about driving business outcomes as opposed to buying likes, buying impressions, buying engagement writ large, which is a, sort of a nondescript metric that means what you want it to mean. I want to drive velocity at retail. I, I want to see results yes. and or my service. I want to drive velocity. I'm a marketer. The faster I sell it, the happier I'm going to be. I think this is the area pro I'm, I'm most proud of from the business standpoint because the marketer cares about one word, growth. Yeah, that's it. Is my business growing or right. is it not? That's how they're going. Right? That is how, that is the one and single most important word. From the early days, and I've been at Facebook now almost eight years, we have been relentlessly focused on are we driving business growth for our clients. To us, it was never about buying media and just impressions or buying just engagement. Early days, there was a lot of people buying the likes and thinking that that was what you had to do to build up your fan base. Sure. Those social metrics, we used to say social metrics are nice, business metrics are better. That's true. Right? <laughs> yeah. We like the social. Yeah. We like the engagement. Brands like to know that communities are engaged and talking about um, their products and their services. But at the end of the day, we have to hold each other accountable for growth. The majority of the people that invest on Facebook, we have 6 million advertisers, 90 million businesses have a presence on Facebook, but the majority of those 6 million advertisers, when you go into the Facebook system to buy ads, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram, or increasingly now it'll be on WhatsApp and Messenger, you tell our system what your business objective is. So the more specific you can say, for example, I need to drive a conversion. I want somebody to come to my website or my mobile app. I want to, people to download my app. I want to drive a sale. You tell our system that's what you're looking to do. Now, most of the marketers have shifted to think about going into the Facebook buying system with a business objective in mind. Sure. We want 100% of every buy to be thought of what is your business objective. Sometimes it might be around brand. Sure. Could be awareness. Correct. Purchase and intent could be. There's a million absolutely. KPIs. You choose the one you like. You choose. The more specific you can tell us, the better we are at actually delivering that outcome. So the good news for marketers is that this is incredibly accountable. This system, and you can. It's a very efficient way for them to deliver on the business objectives that they have. And it ultimately, that's what we're accountable for. Are we driving business growth for our clients? I tell clients very clearly to their, straight to their face, if we're not driving your business, you should not invest with Facebook. If you are unsure that we're, are, you know, we don't have the right, then let's get the right measurement set up. Let's test it. If you're just going to take your 30 tech second TV spot and put it into our system and just run it and hope for, don't do it. Yeah. We don't want people to waste a dollar. We want every single dollar to drive value. You know, you mentioned good old-fashioned 30-second TV spots, and 30-second uh, TV spots have been declared dead uh, every year for the past 15 years. Um, there's a multi-billion dollar business that would beg to differ, although it is facing some headwinds, to be sure. Uh, not the least of which are coming from no one really understanding how Facebook and some of your other Tier 1 tech uh, uh, colleagues are going to approach consumption of streaming video. So could you just tell me a little bit about, if I can't use my 30 second spot that my very cool agency charged me a ton of money for, um, what am I supposed to put in video on Facebook and how are you guys thinking about the future of video? So video is incredibly important. If you were to ask me what are the three biggest consumer trends that we're talking about with clients this year in 2019, it's video, messaging, one-to-one -one and, and small group messaging, and the stories format. From a video standpoint, 20, the latter half of 2018 was a big tipping point for us at Facebook. We have been experimenting with a lot of different ways of trying to bring video to people within Facebook and Instagram. We launched something called Watch, which is now available through the Facebook app. And in August, it sort of hit its yeah. next level of sort of growth, if you will. We now have 400 million people on Watch, 75 million people a day watching on average over 20 minutes. Wow. So it has found a product market fit. Our belief on video, so why is Facebook different than YouTube versus the other places that they could, because you can consume video in a lot of different places. Our point of difference, we believe, is gonna be around the social aspects of watching video together. So if I want to launch and watch something on watch, 
I can invite you, I can invite my other friends, I can create a watch party. And that social aspect, because you have your friend network within, is very, very powerful. And the early experiments that we're starting to see with that kind of content is working very well. This 2019, we are going to be very active in talking with clients about their TV slash video budgets, however they define it, um, because we finally have a really strong consumer offering within Watch. So are you seeing formatic or grammatic changes? Vertical video became a kind of film grammar that spoke yes. to a specific generation. There are uh, production techniques that have evolved even as far back as MTV starting, you know, when MTV started, and I know that's your humble beginnings yes. at MTV, that was a completely different way to shoot a video. It was run and gun shooting, and it was no real filmmaker or videographer would ever have made the mess that the kids were making with video, and yet that it spoke to a generation. Yes. Vertical video had the same thing. Everyone's talked about, we've gone through this video snacking to, you know, lean back. Everyone's had names ad, <laughs> ad nauseum, you know, some thing I'm going to call this, and What's actually happening from your perspective? Because you have the data and none of the rest of us do. What, what are people doing? So we used to think of video as one thing. Yep. And the biggest, I think, aha is video is a many different things. And you talked about some of the ways people are, are you know, you jokingly talked about the way we were defining it, but we do. There are snackable bites where sure. people want that in between, because we have in between time that we've never had before. We have, we're standing online, we've got our mobile device. We're waiting for the train, we're waiting for the subway. We've got time to consume video that we never had before. So they're snackable. Then there's those lean forward moments where I want to interact. And you can interact now with the video that we have on our devices. You can do polling, you can right. uh, comment on it, you can share it. And then there's those lean back, like look, I just want to be entertained. Right. Show me a great piece of content and right. let me be and let me put my ear, you know, earphones in and, and watch it. And so video is no one thing. It is not less than three seconds or less than six or 15 or 30 or three minutes or 15 minutes. We're seeing a variety of forms, formats that are working. And they're all fine in their own level. It just depends on what the consumer mode yeah. is in. So we're so used to as the industry, we want to define it. We want video to be X because it was X. It was. Right? That's consumers, they'll decide what they're doing. Are they snacking? Are they going to lean forward? Are they going to lean back and, and consume it for 20 plus minutes? Well, you know, that I, I'm assuming the benefit of having the incredible amount of data coming in about consumption is that you guys will be able to put the right length message in front of me or the right length of content in front of me when I'm in the various modes. Not all of us have that capability, but it's, it's good to know that's what's coming. <laughs> well, what's, it's, I'll give you a very interesting example. So we've obviously now are testing the ad model within Watch. Sure. And like, how do you insert ads so that it is additive to people as best as it can be? And we've learned that, yes, people need to consume a bit more of the actual content before you serve up an ad. They'll engage more with, they'll, they'll be more willing to stay with the ad if they're sort of, okay, I'm really liking this content. I'm willing to watch a 15 second advertisement and then watch the rest of the content. So we are learning every single day about where to insert the ad, how is it most effective. The good news for marketers that are trying to think about this transition from the TV world into the mobile video world is that Watch actually provides an opportunity for them to get a 15 second video view with most of it being sound on. And in the mobile feed environment and stories environment, that's not necessarily the way right. people consume. They consume much faster, typically less than three seconds. So we're excited about it, but I, you know, there's lots of ways to describe it. I call it an accordion, which okay. maybe is old fashioned, but an accordion of video offerings. Okay. Everything from very, very short sure. to very long. And marketers have to think about assets in that context. I was gonna say, that changes the deliverables list in a very serious way. Totally. And also uh, intent. I think the industry will ultimately figure out how to do that because it, the industry's like that. It just figures it out. Exactly. I really wanna thank you for spending time with me today. This has really been extraordinary. Um, I am looking forward to Facebook owning up to everything you said it was about to own up to because obviously we'd like you to succeed, but everybody's a little scared and uh, doesn't want to be, right? There's no, you, it's not the state we want to be in when it comes to Facebook, so. Well, it is very fair for us to have taken the criticism. We accept that responsibility. I can look you straight in the eye and tell you we are a different company. It is not just that we're saying those things. We have fundamentally changed the profitability of Facebook and made significant investments to deal with the safety and security of our platform. 
over 2018, we made very significant investments. We grew from 10,000 to 30,000 people. That costs real money. Yeah. When you think about putting integrity into every decision that you're making from a product standpoint, how can it be used in a good way? How can it be used in a bad way? What do we do to prevent that? So our actions have to speak louder than words. Yes. And they are. We're putting the money behind it. There is no amount of money or resource that we won't put against trying to protect people on our platform. Wow. Well, I think we're going to leave it there because I don't think you, that's, that is an exclamation point, Carolyn. Thank that's you. Outstanding. Thanks so much Thank for being so here. Much. I'm Shelley Palmer. This is Context for the Future. We'll see you next time.